morning, everyone. Uh, before we begin our study this morning, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity we have each morning, and we're thankful for this new week of study. We invite your spirit uh, to be here to teach us. We know, Lord, that there's much that we need to learn and much to unlearn. And we ask that you can guide and direct in how we uh, search your word, that we can follow uh, the principles that you have set out line upon line, and that we can recognize the need of your Holy Spirit uh, to give the understanding, the same Holy Spirit that inspired the prophets, that we need that Holy Spirit uh, to interpret your word. And so we ask that the Holy Spirit can shine in our hearts and reveal the hidden and dark things that need to be removed and reveal also the glorious things in your word. Be with each person in their personal struggles that we each face. And uh, we ask that um, your presence can be with us throughout this day, throughout this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, so last week we um, we covered a lot of ground just to kind of review a little bit. So, um, we had uh, in in working on these lines from the Book of Judges, we know that these lines themselves. Um, are a zoom into a waymark, right? That's how we've understood that these lines, these lines don't just exist out of, out of nowhere, that they're actually zooming into waymarks and that these waymarks um, are lines that are above the lines that we are looking at. And we know that in this, this whole big line of lines going from creation to the new earth, uh, uh, that we have a waymark called literal Israel, and um, let me see here, I should probably show you these images here. I gotta switch the screen here in a moment, but gotta find this first. So when we were wor working on these lines, we weren't really sure where we were in the big scheme of things, of all of these lines. And a lot of lines and charts. I'm just flipping through them here. So let me see if I can. Okay, so we have this cosmic line, it's called. So that's slide number 409. <clears throat> now, this cosmic line we had with this lampstand and um, so we understand that this, this is your basic chiasm. The cross is the center of this. And uh, we have this line called literal or waymark called literal Israel, which then expands into a line. Now, in this line of literal Israel, of course, we have other lines. So if we take literal Israel here um, and we created these lines, and, and here underneath, I have the line of United Israel, which we haven't done yet. Um, but United Israel is this empowerment of the second angel's message, right? So, so I can't remember exactly why I put this United Israel line down there. Um, uh, so, oh, I remember. So what we're saying is that this, this line of the judges is not a zoom into the line of Moses, but it's a zoom in to United Israel. That is, it's the arrival of this message is going to lead to un this United Israel waymark. So the line of the judges is in between these two, but what leads to United Israel is we, we basically have this period of darkness which would have to be the period of the judges. 
but yet the judges is also a reform line. And so this is something that we've we've been struggling with. How do we how do we look at this reform line of the judges if it doesn't exist? We don't have a line above, so to speak, where the judges are. Right? If that makes sense to people. So here we have Moses, the line of Moses. And and you know, is the period of the judges, is this line that we're using with Gideon, is this related to United Israel? Now, so when we're looking at judges as it relates to um, the historical aspect of the judges, so let's put it that way, it has a place within these lines as as being connected with this period of darkness. But if we were to zoom into this arrival of the first angel, um, you know, if we talked about United Israel, I mean, are we going to say that United Israel, the first angel is Saul, the second angel is David, the third is Sam, Sam uh, Solomon? Would we say that? Or is United Israel even have some bigger line? That is, where does Samuel have a part to play? And, and maybe Samuel does, right? So maybe Samuel, Samuel's the arrival of the first angel or something like that. Or if we zoomed into uh, to Saul, we would find Samuel. We haven't, we haven't parsed out these lines yet. We haven't separated them out and uh, defined them. Um, <clears throat> so we don't know yet. So we don't know how how that how that's going to fit in. Now we could, if we go back to this cosmic line, one one thing we will see is that literal Israel and spiritual Israel are connected, right? By the branches, the third and fifth branch. So when we deal with this spiritual Israel, um, because we haven't drawn out this line yet, right? So, so we haven't got there. I mean, we're still working on this literal Israel line uh, or waymark, and, and we're working on parts of it. But we should be able to see that literal Israel parallels spiritual Israel. Now, then we compare the flood to the Sunday law. So they, they're connected by the second and sixth branch. Now, why is that? And what does that Sunday law mean, that empowerment of the second angel? Because we believe that our line is a zoom into the Sunday law. Or does our line some way, because when we look at spiritual Israel, we haven't drawn up the line. I mean, I would assume that spiritual Israel has a lot to do with, uh, you know, the seven churches, because that would be to me. Um, how I would look at the seven way marks of spiritual Israel, we would take the seven churches. Does that make sense to people? So I'm going to try to draw this out. Um, Um, yeah, because the if if we don't fully understand these lines, how we're working, we we could sort of um, get off track. I don't know if that's so. Let's let's try to figure this out. Sorry about this. Okay. Let's see if this line fits in here. Now you're not sharing the screen? Okay. Yeah, I got to stop sharing there. I knew there was something I was forgetting to do. 
So obviously we have these, you know, this is the branch candlestick. And over here, we're going to have this Sunday law. And here we're going to have spiritual Israel. Okay. So we got spiritual Israel. And then we can take this line. And I would say that spiritual Israel is the seven churches. Right? Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, is it Ephesus, Pergamos, Pergamos, Thyatira, if I got this wrong, um, Sardis, Sardis uh, uh, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay? So, so we have these seven churches. And, and then we can say that we're obviously in this history. So spiritual Israel includes this. So is this Sunday law, which we say we're zoomed into, not part of this? Or how would we connect these two? Because spiritual Israel must include, to some degree, the Sunday law. Because the Sunday law is going to come in this seventh church, right? But we say that we're zoomed into the Sunday law. That is, if we're going to look at this. So now we say that that's a reform line, but we also know it's part of the progressive destruction of four. In some ways, we have the same problem. So I'm going to do it this way. Ephesus, Smyrna. Pergamus, Thyatira, right? So this is going to be the first, second, third, and fourth of this progressive destruction of four. But we can also say that this is a reform line, that is spiritual Israel must be referring to this history all the way to the end. And in some ways, it, it starts at the cross and it goes to the Sunday law, Right? Because you're going to have the church being raised up in connection with the cross, this pure church, and then these apostasies that occur. So you have this progressive destruction of four. And, and this is the first generation. And in the first generation, you're going to either have a building or a destruction of a building. You're going to have the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And then you're going to have a reform line. So, so can we say that this... Spiritual Israel has seven way marks that are a reform line, but it also has a progressive destruction of four that, that leads to a reform line that encompasses this whole final er era. That is when we get to the seventh, right? Which, you know, it's October 22, 1844. We actually have another progressive destruction of four and then a reform line that includes the Sunday law. Like, that's what I, I don't know. But Jeff made the argument that all the seven churches are fulfilled at the end of the world as well. Right. But but that's, that's simply just because um, we have uh, a repeat of history. Every line... Uh, Every reform line all comes together at the end of the world. So, so yeah, so you can take that history and you can lay it over top of our history. I mean, you can even take like the seven churches uh, to refer to, I'll change my microphone here. Um, the seven churches being referring to you know, Adventist history with the reform line at the end, just as we did uh, with uh, just, you can just take that line that I drew behind me there, which I didn't complete. And you could just put that into our history, starting with um, 1798 as the time of the end, right? So you can have, 
that history. Or you could even uh, zoom it in more and start it with October 22nd, 1844. So, but you could also take it into our history and even place it at 1989. So, so we know that we can take all of these patterns and we can zoom into them and they will give us more detail about our time. So that, that's not really a problem. But the problem is for us to sort that out, to know what it is we're doing when we're looking at something. So I would say that most of the time when people are asking me questions about lines, what, what I do is I usually ask them, what line are you asking about? Now, that, that's kind of um, a little bit cheeky on my part because uh, we don't know what line often we're talking about, and I don't expect them to know. What I'm wanting them to do, though, is to think about it. Um, because if you're going to be talking about some way mark and what it means, you must have a context in which you're understanding that way mark. So if you're going to ask about raffia, for instance, so uh, I was at Collins yesterday uh, for a few hours talking with him, uh, trying to convince him to, to speak at the camp meeting uh, this summer. So I guess I'm going to be presenting his stuff with his notes and he'll be there to correct me. But anyway, um, but we were talking about the lines. So we were talking about Raffi and Paneum. Well, Raffi and Paneum have different uh, places depending on, because they're symbols. Um, depending which line you're talking about. So when it comes to January 6th, uh, 2021, um, we can say that that's raffia. But then we have to know what line we're talking about. And we know that Paneum is going to be a response to raffia. So the Democrats brought an end to the United States, right? Trump is the last president. The United States became controlled by the globalists. That's going to be Xerxes being defeated uh, by the Greeks, right? If we just look at it in that context of the first few verses of Daniel chapter 11. But that history is going to repeat again, isn't it? In Daniel, in Daniel chapter 11, you're going to have uh, Xerxes... Uh, well, that is technically you're going to have um, Persia being replaced by Greece. But then Greece is going to be divided and then the, Greece is going to uh, end up having the north and the south within Greece itself. And then a battle goes on between Egypt and Syria, right? The Ptolemaic Empire and the Seleucid Empire. And then finally, uh, the Seleucid Empire ends up being victorious in the end. And, that, and that's really going to go all the way through, not just in the history of Greece, but it's going to be repeated to some degree in the history in the time of the Millerites, right? So we're going to see, uh, because Daniel 11 moves all the way through that history with the king of the north and the king of the south. And then you're going to see uh, the king of the south come again, but it's a new power, right? It's not going to be Egypt. And that was the mistake that the Millerites made initially, because that view uh, that Uriah Smith presents in Daniel and the Revelation isn't his, it's uh, Alexander Keith's uh, uh, understanding. And, uh, and that was understood by the Millerites. So they accepted that view that there's three powers there in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. France, um, Turkey and Egypt, right? So, so it wasn't something Uriah Smith invented, but they're making a mistake in reasoning. I know this goes back to our studies on examining the foundation, but this North and South symbolism, it occurs also with ancient Israel, right? So you're gonna have Northern and Southern Israel, and they're gonna be types as well. And, and you're going to have the initial division, which is like the revolution. And then you're going to have uh, what happens in that civil war in 742 BC. And the, the results that follow after that. And what's in 
Daniel chapter, not Daniel, Isaiah 7 and 8, definitely relate to the civil war at the end of the world in the United States, right? So, so we have all these histories. They've all been tied together. And <clears throat> so when we're talking about a line, the real problem that we have is we don't know what line we're in. So we can say, well, Raffia is uh, January 6th, 2021. And, and that's correct. And we know that Paneum will follow, but the Paneum that follows has to be within the context of those lines. Um, that is that raffia is definitely not the raffia that we mark as midnight on that bigger line above where we have um, 9-11 midnight, midnight cry, the Sunday law. We've never come to that midnight yet. Right. We're not to that way mark. What we originally understood as raffia is still future. But we are experiencing, and we have experienced raffia typically uh, internally within the movement. So let's, uh, let's try to look at it this way. So when we go down to these lines of uh, here, so we're, we're dealing with the lines of, of Gideon. So that's why we're, we're going through all of that. In this line, the Jeroboam line, we have things that are internal. And so if we're going to look at this line, this line is a zoom into some other line, right? That is, it's a zoom into uh, the judge's line. And so, so we haven't, but even this judge's line is a zoom into some other line. So normally we would just say, well, Raffia and Paneum are uh, midnight and the midnight cry, but that's not necessarily true in every line. You know, I mean, you, you could maybe try to make a case for that. But um, so when we're talking about January 6th, 2021 is being raffia, what line are we in? Do we even know yet? Any thoughts on that? I would say it's a big line. January 6th. Of uh, uh, the big line of which which big line? Do you mean it's the it's the raffia of 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law? So you're saying we came to midnight? Um, 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 um. <laughs> See, so I think we were still correct. Um because when we were talking about, okay, so when we first came up with the Raffia Waymark, what was Raffia supposed to be? It was going to be the King of the South being USSR, or sorry, Russia. Okay, Russia, yeah. Hitting USA. Okay, so it was supposed to be about Russia and the USA, right? And so Russia that was going to be. Well, it was actually internal. Was... Well, yeah, but originally we had it as Russia and the USA. So we believe yeah. that it's going to be, and it was going to be on, well, originally it wasn't going to be on November 9th because we didn't have November 9th yet uh, in 2017. It wasn't going to be till a year and a half later that we come up with November 9th. But, but we did apply it once we had November 9th. We applied it to November 9th, right? So originally we had Rafi and Paneum. So Chao Tu is going to give us this understanding, though some people say it wasn't his idea. But when I talked to him, it, he said it was. Uh, it was from their study, and, and him and his wife had come up with, the, with uh, Rafia. Now, Paneum wasn't. Um, that's going to come from once they start sharing Rafia, then Paneum comes into play. I don't know exactly how that happened, whether Jeff 
got it when he was in, in Wales or whether it was um, study afterwards, but he's, he's going to present Rafi and Paneum in Alberta um, in January. Uh, well, it's 13th, 14th, and 15th. It's three days that he does these studies. Um, so well, uh, that's how how would he do his present about Panium? He does? Yes. Originally, when Jeff was there that first time? Yes, and then Jeff presented it the week after in Holland. Okay. But it's only after that uh, that then Jeff connected it with uh, Caesarea Philippi and done that. You know, he didn't do that at Holland. You know, all the pandemic and things that go yeah. there. So that, the, that, the pandemic is going to be presented in Alberta. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, so it's developing. OK. So they have the idea that there is panium, but they haven't they haven't fleshed it out yet. And what that yes. means. Right. OK. OK. So they have the raffian and panium, but but there's going to be more that develops. And. Um, and then when we get November 9th, we we say that, well, November 9th is going to be raffia, but we don't have anything for Paneum, uh, though it seems pretty obvious that if that the J July 18 date that shows up, that that would be uh, Paneum, right? So that's what we then have is for a while. Um, we have this raffia and Paneum being November 9th to July 18th. And we see from Odilio's study how the pandemic fit into those way marks and and especially also continu continuing all the way to december 25th 2021 so the the mandates and all that fit into that structure um so so we can see that jeff was correct he just didn't know what he was talking about right we didn't even know i mean he talks about this pandemic you know, that's something just way off. I mean, we don't even know what that means until we experience it. And, you know, and it's going to be connected with that Gideon line uh, below as well. Um, because, you know, we got the March 27th date, which is the week, the 100 days of prayer that start on that date. And that really, to me, is when uh, this, this whole thing with the pandemic really comes uh, to hit home. Uh, for most people in the world, as far as uh, the restrictions that occur. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so now we have this, this raffia waymark, which is November 9th, but then with January 6th, we see that January 6th is raffia. Now, but on this line, it's actually the empowerment of the second angel. So it's not even showing up on this line as uh, the formalization of the second angel. It's not showing up as midnight. It's showing up as the midnight cry. No. So a person could argue, well, maybe our line's wrong because of that. But I doubt it. I, I think we have to recognize that if January 6th is raffia, that there is some other line that we haven't that we're not addressing right here, in which that is is midnight. And that line would have on it the midnight cry, whether we have it as a date now or date in the future, probably after it happens, we would recognize that the North and the South in this line is not about the United States and Russia. And, and I don't think the United States and the Russia was a correct understanding of raffia and pinin that is we we recognize that that the soviet union falling um that the flood only came up to the neck right but then the idea was the head was moscow but isn't the head more the ideology I mean, do people agree with me that Jeff was wrong when he tried to say that Russia was that Moscow was the head? I'm not sure. It could be the ideology. But um, 
just with Roth, because with Roth going on at the moment with Russia, then being linked with China as well, because you have that ideology, communist China, mm -hmm. so connected to Russia. So I wouldn't, to me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be ready to close that door. Okay. But we do know that it's the globalists that inherit um, that same power that um, that made France the king of the south. Yes. And one of the problems with Russia is it's not an atheistic power anymore. Russia is a, well, you know, their official church is the Russian Orthodox. It's a type of Catholic. So, so that would be a, something that we have to throw in the center. Yes, it's, that, that would kind of throw a spanner into the, the works, so to say. Yeah. I'm still thinking, is there some other way we can understand it? You know? Yeah, so, but but when we look at January 6th, we, we, we would say that that's the globalists. And so the globalists took over the United States. It wasn't Russia. It wasn't China. I mean, and I think that China is a red herring, personally. Uh, I, I don't think that they actually have a part to play in, in Bible prophecy. Um, I mean, they mentioned one time in the Bible in uh, Ezekiel. But, but I don't think that th the countries are the, really the issue here at this point. I think it's the ideology, the ideas. And, and China as a country, obviously, they're going to be on on that side of globalism at some point. Um, but, you know, that's just my opinion. It, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, so what we, what we saw is that we have now a January 6th, which we label as a raffia. I mean, this is what Colin would do. And that we're going to have paneum. And this paneum is going to be, well, in Colin's view, it's going to be Trump coming into power again. So that's going to be the king of the north defeating the king of the south. In my view, Trump doesn't have to be a part of that. And actually, I don't think he can be. But that's where Colin and I differ. I just believe that uh, the Republicans will take over the United States again. But this is going to be. Uh, and, and now we can say that this happens at the Sunday law. Right. So we know that um, apostate Protestantism. And we could call it apostate republicanism. It's a repudiation of the Constitution. Um, they come together. And, and that Sunday law is going to come first in the United States in this Protestant, quotation mark, Republican, quotation mark, um, union in the United States with the defeat of the globalists, that is, um, is it really a defeat of the globalists or is it an alliance with the globalists with uh, a religious head? An alliance. Yeah, so it's an alliance because Ellen White says it is, right? So this alliance is going to be made to um, further an agenda, which is the agenda of Sunday. And this is, to me, it's the only thing that makes sense that the globalists and, and all of these parties are maneuvering, not as if they exist, you know, completely as these um, consolidated, you know, you don't have really just, you know, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet is these really well-organized structures, but they are ideologies. And each of these ideologies, each of these, members of these ideologies they have a personal agenda you know on a personal level and then on on sort of the sphere of influence that they have but overall um for the globalists they will see that their concession or whatever you want to call it this alliance with the united states is necessary for them to further their agenda and so so you so the americans 
who are obviously, you know, against all of the principles of, we'll say, the World Economic Forum, which we could represent as the globalists, that somehow the global, globalists will, in a sense, bow to this American power that has, has conquered them, but also made an alliance with them. But the papacy has this part to play as well, because this whole thing is to place the papacy upon the throne of the earth, right? In the exaltation of the Sunday. So this is what we've always believed as Adventists. We just, we just now have more details in which to, you know, sort of envision what's going to happen. But how it's going to happen exactly and when, I don't think that we can, we can know that yet. So what I see is that when we have this response in the United States where the globalists are defeated, it's not going to be the Sunday law on Ellen White's line, that it's still a precursor to the Sunday law. just as this pandemic was. These things are setting in place the pieces for, for those events that Ellen White calls the Sunday law. Because what has to happen before the Sunday law? Because if you're going to look at this happening, let's say Trump came into power again, but even if it wasn't Trump, it was going to be just the Republican Party and, uh, over the next couple of years or whatever. That's not going to be enough to bring in the Sunday law because what has to happen before the Sunday law? Now, we could say final events are rapid ones. So all, right. all these calamities, destructions in city. Yeah. And the people then think it's uh, because they've been desecrating the Lord's Day or Sunday. Right. So they're... They, demand in our sense or they're asking for Sunday legislation. Right. So so those things could happen very quickly. And I'm not denying that they can't. I mean, in Colin's scenario, he believes that Nashville is going to uh, be destroyed. So that's going to happen from what I understand very soon. Right. And and that this will unite this movement and all these different things will happen. Um, as a result of that. Um, but I think the lines are showing us that that's not the case, that it's not gonna happen that soon, that there is a work that has to be done first, the upper room work, the individual work, um, and however it's gonna unfold, we don't know, but once we are working together, then, you know, God can use us, then persecution comes. But, you know, all of these scenarios, we, we know about them. I mean, we've, we've talked about them for a long time, how they're going to unfold and when they're going to unfold. I don't think it is, is shown to us at this point. So, you know, if you believe that a Sunday law is imminent, that's fine. I mean, you know, A.T. Jones, I mean, he believed that, Ellen White believed that a Sunday law was imminent. And I think that's something that we always have to uh, recognize. But exactly where we are in those lines, in that stream of time, um, until that event arrives, um, I mean, we will see it first before anybody else recognizes it, because we're watching and waiting. But I just don't think it's going to unfold in the scenarios that people are putting forward. Now, of course, we had the one scenario that it, it related to the pandemic. Um, so there was in a time in this movement, whether that's still the case, where people were saying, well, these you know, mandates are going to continue. And, but now we're already seeing uh, the backlash with the pandemic, which, of course, would have to happen once uh, the science catches up and uh, outstrips the propaganda. So the propaganda was there uh, 
for a long time, right? Now, as the science starts to look at it, people are questioning a lot of the decisions that were being made. And so at some point, you know, that will be sorted out. And, and what you would have is, is a backlash, right? So, so this is what we have happening. We have something unfolding in front of us and we're trying to interpret it, right? We're trying to say it was January 6th. Was that, you know, Rafi? And if it was, well, when is Panium? And what is it going to look like when uh, the United States uh, is no longer in control of the globalists, right? Because it, at least in this direct way and the Repod Republican Protestant, um, the King of the North defeats the King of the South. How, how is that going to look and when, what is, what's going to happen at that event? And if that is the January 6th is midnight on this bigger line that Jeff has and that the midnight cry is Paneum, then, uh, then the Sunday law would come in connection with that. But I still think the lines are showing that we're still in a typical, typical lines, but that we're not in the actual event. We're in the way mark of the Sunday law. That is, all of our history is a zoom into the Sunday law. But what, we, what Ellen White calls the Sunday law, um, I don't think the situation is set up for that to happen yet. It could happen fairly quickly, but that's just what I see from everything that we've studied regarding these lines. But, and I'm not trying to preach, a, uh, you know, to give a peace and safety message. I'm just saying that we have a work to do now and that the ideas about the Sunday law that I see from my perspective aren't very different from what we expected with July 18th, that we are expecting a type of vindication, not that that is the, the foremost reason that people are coming to their conclusions, but it's just part of human nature. We want to see these things fulfilled, right? We want an end of all things, right? We wanna see this history close up. I do as much as anyone. But we need to learn from these lines what God has been showing us. And one is that we know we can't predict events. And it's not even just about a date. We don't know when things are going to happen. What we need to know is our present duty. We need to be watching and waiting. We need to be measuring the time. But we can't neglect the work that he has set before us. And sometimes we want to, right? We, we would just want to get there because uh, the work that's before us is extremely difficult. So now the image of the beast, you know, Iran wrote in there about the image of the beast. That's one of the things that has to happen before the Sunday law, the image of the beast, the image of the beast test. And that is developing. And that's going to be a test for Seventh-day Adventists. So there are things that have to happen within the Adventist church as well. Um, and we have to have a message that we can give, whatever that message is, however it's supposed to look. And we have to give it. That is, Adventists are going to have to receive this message. And, and so this message is much bigger than our studies or any of us as individuals or even any of us as a group. This is something that God is developing uh, as a part of a body, as a part of a movement. Um, and so we don't know the answer to that question yet. <clears throat> so that, that's kind of the summary of where we are with these lines. So... What we've been trying to do is to take this story of Gideon, uh, chapter six, seven, and eight, and look at these events and apply these to the line. 
And we can see that Judges 7 primarily addresses um, the July 18th waymark, right? So we had it as, as that. And there was a bunch of things that we um, still hadn't resolved. We had some questions um, that we were asking. You know, so one was you're going to have um, when Gideon defeats uh, Midian, right? So this, we know that Midian symbolizes strife or conflict within the movement. Um, that they're going to, and he calls all of these, these different tribes, right? So he called all these different tribes. They're going to get 30. 2,000, and then uh, 22,000 of them leave, and you have 10,000, and then from that 10,000, they get this 300, and then when they defeat the Midianites, when they come against their camp and the Midianites are fleeing, of the tribes that they had initially called, Naphtali, Asher, um, and of course, uh, you have Manasseh. But Zebulun was originally part of that 32,000. Zebulun is not listed here. And, and what was the reason for that? What did Zebulun represent? Okay, the SDA church, right? And, and that was because of Odilio's study with the organized church, right? We had the organized church on May 23rd, um, 1863, and you take the, whatever it is, uh, 41,700, I can't remember the number. Um, And Adelia had connected that to July 18th. Uh, 57, yeah, Adelia. 57,400 days from May 23rd, 1863 to July 18th. So we had many people with us in this movement when it came to this July 18th way mark. Right? But there are going to be people who just, when July 18th fails, where do they go? Back to the church. They go back to the church, right? So Zebulun does not continue in pursuing. After July 18th, does that make sense to people? Logical. Okay. So in some ways, when we, when we take this uh, line, so I'm just going to go back to these lines. So, man, there's a lot of threads here that we have to uh, sort through. But, you know, here's, here's the Zebulun uh, waymark, right? So that, that connects us to the organization of the Adventist church. And uh, then when we get to uh, these lines here, And we have July 18th, it's the arrival of the second angel. So we know that um, groups are being tested in each of these lines, right? In each of these messages. So you have this first angel, right? This, this, this is, is a group is being tested and that group is, is not going to uh, be benefited by the second angel's message. So this is going to lead up to the first disappointment, we'll call it, July 18th. And we have all of this separation that happens uh, right there at July 18th. Um, but that work continues. There's a further separation that occurs in the movement. Because 
people have to receive this second angel in order to be benefited by the third. So we can see to a large degree that this, in, the, in our application of Gideon, it is about this movement. But this movement is also connected to the Adventist church. And those that go back to the Adventist church would be Zebulun. But we still have Naphtali, um, Asher, and Manasseh. So what do they represent? And we're also going to have Ephraim as well. So Ephraim, though, um, they're going to be invited, but they don't come. Or do they come? They come here. Yeah, so here they're going to be invited. They were invited before, but now they're going to be invited again. And this time they come. And then they complain that they weren't invited initially, but they were. Okay, so we got um, Naphtali, Manasseh, and Asher, and then we have Ephraim. So who is Ephraim? Who is this group that was initially invited, but now um, is going to participate? Would that be those that are called out of the Adventist church? Okay, well, so after July 18th? Right. Okay. Well, that's possible. I mean, one other option we looked at is that they represented people in the movement who didn't accept July 18th, right? So they didn't come with that call. They didn't support July 18th. But after July 18th, they are now um, going to participate. So that, that's the other option. So we have an option of um, people who were in the Adventist church that didn't participate in July 18th but come afterwards, or people who were in the movement never supported July 18th because they were called. Uh, and, and maybe it's both. Maybe that's true of both. Because there are people who didn't want to do time setting and were they justified in not setting time. To a point. Yeah, to a point, right? So it depends on how much light they have. But up to me, I wouldn't blame uh, a Seventh-day Adventist um, who hears about, you know, somebody setting time and, and then saying, well, you know, we're not supposed to set time. Now, maybe it's more difficult with somebody that's in the movement, but there was a lot of people in the movement that didn't want to have anything to do with time setting, either July 18th or even November 9th, 2019. They didn't want to set dates. And now I'm definitely one of those who doesn't like setting dates, but I recognize that God was leading, but I had the tools to do that. You know, so for me, um, you know, I could see the 391 and a half days, you know, from noon on October 13th to this November 9th prediction. I could see all these structures. I knew Samuel Snow's letters. I could see that whatever was happening, this was under God's direction. This wasn't something that man created. It wasn't like any other time setting that I have ever seen other than may maybe Millerite history in the multiple witnesses and in even some ways much greater than what happened in Millerite history. I mean, we have some very solid uh, information that, that tells us that these, these dates are correct and part of a structure that's impossible for man to have created. But yet I still knew 
that you know July 18th was on a line of failed predictions, especially you know once we once we had passed November 9th and we had a failed prediction, that is the prediction of uh, Parminder and Tess had failed. Um, and then we could see that, well, July 18th is on that line, it's on that structure. Why would we expect that date to then be fulfilled? Um, that's what I struggled with. So I knew that it could fail and, and its failure wouldn't be a destruction of the lines. It would actually be a witness to the lines that the lines were given there to witness to the fact that we made this prediction, but we would be wrong about the event. And then we could see we were experiencing Millerite history, which, which was something that was needful. And, and to me, it, it makes all the sense in the world. If you're paralleling Millerite history, you would have to experience the disappointments that they experienced. So, so Ephraim then can represent uh, people who didn't accept time setting, but we, we could just put it that way. Would that, would that be satisfactory? It can fit. Okay. But now after July 18th, whether that's just July 18th itself or something to do with our lines, um, they are going to come and participate, but they're gonna claim that they weren't called. Now, so, so we have uh, Zebulun figured out, we have Ephraim figured out, at least all these are tentative. But now we're going to have um, Manasseh, Asher, and Naphtali. So why, why these tribes? Why do these, why are these three then pursuing after July 18th? Do we have enough information to draw any conclusions about these? There's there any ideas? I don't even mind guessing. I, I don't see that we have enough to be able to draw the conclusion yet. Okay. But that's me. Okay, now we did have um, Naphtali as connected with Zebulun. So what do I mean by that? Which story did we have Naphtali and Zebulun connected in? In the story of Barak, okay? So, So Naphtali and Zebulun are connected there. Now we're going to have Naphtali connected in these lines as well. Um, so just as we had Zebulun, we had uh, also Naphtali. And Naphtali is going to be connected um, with November 13th, 1833. And that's going to be the falling of the stars. And so Naphtali, and what else is there about Naphtali? What do we know about Naphtali as a symbol? You know, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words, right? So we can see that there. Uh, a goodly answer, speech.
if he's <clears throat> if he's compared with a hind, is that not a type of a deer that runs quickly? Yeah, but it's, it, yeah. And it's let loose, shellac, sent away, cast away, pushed away. Um, so it's not so much about being free as um, being pushed out. And, and Asher, of course, we can look at Asher too. His bread shall be fat and he shall re yield royal dainties. Um, you know, if we wanted to kind of put this into more, uh, Asher shall, food shall be rich and he shall yield royal delicacies. Um, then he giveth dainties of a king. And of course, Manasseh, because uh, Gideon is of Manasseh, right? Now, with Naphtali, we had um, in these lines here. So again, we have this with Naphtali. We have this November 13th, 1833. It goes to January 27th, 1980. If we're going to count Naphtali uh, in this structure, uh, dealing with the falling of the stars. Uh, Angela gives us some verses, Psalm 42, 1 to 2, and Matthew 5 to 6, 5 or 6. Uh, if somebody wants to look those up, see how they apply. Uh, but that's going to connect with um, this history of the August 11th, 1980 date. So there's going to be Naphtali, January 27th. Uh, 10 days later is my 17th birthday. And then on August 11th, 1980, uh, that's going to be 14,587 days prior to July 18th. So we have some symbols there that we can connect uh, just as we did with Zebulun. <clears throat> so Zebulun and Naphtali have this uh, role in prophecy. In, in this structure here. So these are these, these witnesses. Now we can say that these can represent messages as well. Um, now we have with Naphtali the 53,400 days. Um, it's 1,780 prophetic months. So that's a symbol, the 178. And there's 187 days from the spring equinox to the fall equinox, and 178 days from the fall equinox to the spring equinox. And, and so those both represent July 18. Um, So I can't remember what I did with Asher as far as a number. I don't think this one's correct. Because um, I had some of these working copies and they're all just a mess. But um, so that I got Asher there. Uh, he was born, so, okay. so I don't really have anything other than this number. So that one's obviously not correct. So this doesn't work. Those years wouldn't work. So, <clears throat> so what do Asher and Naphtali and Manasseh represent then? What, what could we say about them? They are mes messages, right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> now, can we say they represent um, the messages that 
are predominant in different parts of the movement. Okay, how would you see that? Okay, um, so with, um, so Asher has this aspect of food, right? It's, it's royal food. So what would that be as a symbol, as far as a message is concerned? If he yields royal delicacies, or if he, uh, royal dainties. His bread shall be fat. So Asher would at least represent some kind of studying of God's word that is revealing uh, all kinds of royal dainties or delicacies. So what would that represent then in this message? What aspect of that message is being represented? Would this be the study of God's word, such as we're doing right now? Or the lines? Or lines of, yeah, the lines and all the chronology and all of these. Wheels, you know, wheels and such. Yeah, these charts and diagrams and, and all of these just amazing details such as Stephen presented yesterday, would that not be represented by Asher? Would appear to be. Yes, I think so. And not that, excuse me, what also comes to me is the, the promise of God that he would raise up a priestly and royal nation. Okay. And we're consecrated to him. Okay. And then Naphtali, these are uh, it's a part of the message that's pushed out, right? Treated roughly. And, but he giveth goodly words. Would that be uh, the part of the message where, in spite of how people are being treated, uh, they're willing to listen and cooperate and, you know, apologize and, and act Christ like, even if they're treated badly? the importance on the message not so much the messenger right but giving goodly words i mean to me that is an important part of this message right it's not enough to be right we have to recognize also that we have to be christ-like in how we talk to one another um and so this is a part of the message that it's necessary that is we have to act in this way we have to study for ourselves and we have to we have to have Christ-like words. Now, now what about Manasseh? What part of the message would Manasseh represent? Any ideas on that? Okay, what is Manasseh as a tribe? Remember, it's part of Joseph, right? But it's it's not, usually Joseph refers to Ephraim, right? Ephraim and Joseph are interchangeable. But Joseph gets this double portion. One portion is Ephraim and one is Manasseh. Now, who's the eldest?
So it's in, in Genesis chapter 48. Uh, Jacob is going to bless Ephraim and Manasseh. So what ends up happening there? So he's going to bless them. Ephraim is on his right hand. Uh, he, he, Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left, so, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. What, what does this mean here? How would we express this now? Now, Israel, of course, is Jacob. So, well, right hand's normally considered the side of favor. Right. But, but Jacob's going to put his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn. So why does Joseph place them this way in front of Jacob? And why does Jacob switch hands? Because Ephraim develops to be the more dominant tribe. Right. So he's going to bless Ephraim, even though Ephraim is um, the younger one, right? Well, he sends it is blessing both, but... Uh... Yeah, but he's going to give him a different blessing, and he's going to give the blessing of the right hand. Yeah, see, Ephraim has a, a greater blessing than Manasseh. Right. Right. So... Um, now, we know Ephraim and Manasseh have a part to play here in this story, right? So uh, we have Zebulun and Naphtali. They're sort of a pair in, in the story of Judges. And, and then we have this Ephraim-Manasseh issue that arises in Gideon, right? Because Gideon's from the tribe of Manasseh. He's going to invite the tribe of Ephraim. They're not going to acknowledge that they were invited. Um, but then once the battle with the Midianites occurs, again, a message is set, sent to Ephraim, and Ephraim is going to respond, right? Though Ephraim is later going to complain that they weren't invited. So we have Ephraim and Manasseh here in this relationship in the story of Judges. So we say that Ephraim represents those that didn't accept time setting. Uh, so what does Manasseh represent, and how would we connect this with this story? I mean, why do we have Gideon from Manasseh? What, is, what role is Manasseh playing here, as we've seen in um, the story of the judges as we've gone through it? You can think for a little bit. Oh, I'm thinking that the last shall be first and the first last. And we who are now, in a sense, the, the cadre of the movement, will have to step aside when the flood of people comes in, you know, around the Sunday law time and when it's finally passed. Okay. Um, 
I mean, I always like to think way ahead. I know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we got um, so we have Ephraim and Manasseh. Now we know, of course, Manasseh. Um, now, of course, it's just the same name. But is there any connection between Manasseh and the twenty-five twenty? or even just Manasseh the king himself in his experience, does it relate to the tribe of Manasseh or the symbolism uh, being connected with Manasseh? It should. Okay. Um, well, we know the name means something about let him forget, something to that effect. Uh, well, the tribe would have been uh, scattered about uh, 40, was it 44 years prior? Okay, so explain a little bit what that means. It's part of the, uh, the 10 tribes. I think even the, the eastern side would have been uh, um, scattered even before the other tribes. And then uh, Ephraim, and I think it's part the other part of Manasseh, and th there's that uh, Passover of Ezekiel, and he invites the northern tribes to that just prior to Samaria being taken by Assyria. Okay. So, so, that, so yeah. that would have been scattered around 721. So then King Manasseh, he's then ruling about 44 years after that, when he's taken to Babylon. Okay, so, so there's going to be 44 years from when Manasseh is scattered to Manasseh being taken captive, the king. Okay. Uh, one thing, too, about Asher. Uh, in the numbering of Asher, um, the difference between the numbering in Numbers chapter uh, 2 and Numbers 26 is 11,900. So that's something to keep in mind about mind about Asher. Because Asher then in this context would symbolize, it would be that 32 years and 7 months on the solar calendar that is 33 years and 7 months on the Islamic calendar, right? Yes. So that would symbolize uh, issues dealing with Islam. Now, uh, with uh, Manasseh, um, in Numbers chapter 2, Manasseh has 32,200, and then it has 52,700 in Numbers 26. Uh, a difference of an increase of men of war of 20,500 in that period of time. Um, So what else do we know about Manasseh then in connection with Ephraim? So we know Manasseh is the elder one, but Ephraim gets um, that special blessing. He's going to be enlarged. It's Ephraim's going to become basically Joseph. Um, so the, the larger the tribes and, and the northern tribes are going to be called Ephraim because it's the largest tribe, and that's where uh, Samaria is in Ephraim.
Any other thoughts? Okay, so no other thoughts on that? Just with uh, Zebulun and Naphtali. Yeah. They were mentioned together, uh, associated with Galilee of the Gentiles. It mentions them in Matthew 4, mm -hmm. verse 15, and then Isaiah 9, verse 2. So it's uh, Matthew 4. Uh, 15 is uh, quoting from Isaiah 9, verse 2. So yeah. Just when Jesus began his ministry. Yeah, the people that we all have seen a great light, they that uh, dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. So if you go to the first verse, nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. And at the first, he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And afterward did more grievously grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations, the people that walked in darkness. So, so what is this talking about in Isaiah 9-1? Like, why, why do we have this? What is it talking about? Just literally. So remember, this is in connection with the prophecy of Isaiah 7. So this prophecy of Isaiah 7 is actually continuing all the way to chapter 12. That it is, it's, it's all a unit, Isaiah 7 to 12. So it's going to talk about this battle, um, of, you know, the civil war. It's going to go through what's going to happen with Assyria coming in in chapter 8 right? The Syrian invasion. And then um, <clears throat> um, just talks about all the things that are going to happen because of this. Um, and in 8.16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob. And I will look for him. Behold, I am the children whom the Lord hath given me for signs. So who are the children that are given for signs and for wonders in Israel? So who's speaking and who are these children? Does anybody know? Is that the uh, sons of uh, Isaiah? Yeah, so these are Isaiah's sons, right? So in chapter 7, uh, Shergeshub, right, his son, is a symbol. And, and he's also going to have another son, Mahar Shalal Hashbaz, right? And he's going to be a sign, right? So these are signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And then it says, and when they shall say, Unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, and they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when 
At the first, he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations, right? So is this talking about the affliction by the Assyrians in, in the original context? Thanks, so. Okay. So how would this relate to what you were talking about before with Manasseh? Isn't Manasseh going to be the one that's uh, in, in that occupying that territory beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations? Yes. Okay. Uh, the Eastern tribe. Yeah, right. The Eastern tribe of Manasseh. Okay, so, so there's a lot more here than, you know, what we can address presently. Now, we know uh, in 9 verse 6, for unto us a child is born, to unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, we know that this is a reference to Christ, but they have talked about this child that's going to be born to a virgin, which is going to be Manasseh. But this can't be referring to Manasseh. This is referring to, because if we were to look at this pro prophecy, the prophecy properly, there is a progression that happens in this, this history. So it's, it's making a comparison between what's happening to Israel at that time to what's going to happen. That is, it is messianic in its scope. So Isaiah is, is being told, or he's telling, that all of these things that are happening to you, they are, they are prophetic and they relate to the coming Messiah. Now, is that true that what's happened to, you know, in this history in 742 BC, when this prophecy is given, that that's related to the coming of the Messiah? Because if this is the seven times that's being talked about, right, the commencement of, of, the captivity for Judah. It's he's going to be referencing here um, also the captivity for northern Israel. And, and we can see that these two are tied together in the 22520s, right? And when uh, Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 is given the prophecy of the 70 weeks, he's also going to be referencing the 2520. But most Christians have never picked up on these references. That is, they, they can see that there's a messianic prophecy here, but they don't know how to relate it to the context in which Isaiah is speaking. So when we come back to this tomorrow, we're going to look at this in more detail. We're going to look at um, how... The understanding of the 2520 is connected to this message and why it's essential to know the things that we know if we're going to understand what's coming on this world. I know that's a fairly broad uh, topic, but um, that we need to understand these lines. So there's something about these lines that is the 2520 that's tying this history at the start of that civil war to our civil war and, and, and all the history in between. Can we see that? So anyway, any final comments? Because I know we didn't finish our thoughts here. But. <clears throat> 
Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study uh, this morning and for each person that participated. We pray, Lord, that uh, you can be with us throughout this day. Um, may your angels watch over us. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. And may we respond to the light that you are giving. Help us to, to see things clearly. Be with us now throughout this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.